to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse number 1. Welcome to our study of Song of Solomon. In this series of lessons, we've been looking at the main ideas and the key concepts and making practical application along the way to the living messages of the Old Testament. Our purpose in studying Old Testament books is given to us in Romans chapter 15, verse 4. The Bible says the things that were written before time are written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might find hope. There is hope. There is patience, there is comfort to be found in the Old Testament, and the great wisdom that Song of Solomon gives us applies to marriage. The theme of the Song of Solomon is the beauty or the celebration of married love. Probably, Song of Solomon is one of the most least studied and least read books in the Old Testament, if not the Bible as a whole. And when we think about why, why is that the case? God gave us a book about the beauty of married love and it's not studied very often. Well, oftentimes people view it as Old Testament and say, well, it's no good for us today. Again, we've already mentioned that's not true. Sometimes books like these are taken with the wrong view in mind. Is this about Christ? Is this about Israel? Is this about marriage? What is this book about? And so understanding some of the key concepts will help us to appreciate this book. The key word in the book is the word love. This is mentioned some 30 times in the Song of Solomon. Love is at the center of every marriage, every home, and every family. That self-sacrificing, Love that puts others before self that Jesus had, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 9, that God was the author of, Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, and that is pivotal in every marriage today is what we need, Ephesians 5, verse 21 through 31. One of the key verses is found in Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Listen to these beautiful words. Solomon says, or the Shulamite says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. When we think about this verse, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7, it illustrates for us the power of love. It's as strong as death. It's flames, the flames of jealousy. Cannot get into it if we do our best to, to stay true to love as God wanted us to. And then he says, if a man were give all the wealth of his house for love, be an utter waste. Nothing is more important than the love we have between God, between our spouses, and for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today. And so this book, it celebrates the, the beauty, the, the sanctity of married love between one man and one woman for life. Genesis 2.24, the Bible says, Therefore, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The, the building of the family. When God created Eve out of the side of Adam, Adam gave, him, uh, to, gave her to him as a, a helpmate to help him along life's journey, that unit was created, that family unit. There's the leaving of father and mother and starting one's own family. And so one man, one woman for life, living the kind of love life that God wants them to as they strive to put him first in everyday life. As we think now about some other key ideas in the Song of Solomon, 
One of the key phrases which is pivotal in understanding the book and in understanding marriage and relationships and, and even the sexual side of it is found in chapter 2, verse number 7, chapter 3, verse 5, and mentioned again in chapter 8, verse number 4. Listen to these words. In chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says, I charge you, this is the Shulamite speaking, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. What do we learn from this idea of mentioned three times, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases? Here's one of the basic concepts. There's no need to rush in. There's no need to especially rush into the physical aspect and things of that nature. Take it slow. Take your time. Make sure this is the right person for you. Don't stir up or awaken love until it pleases. You need to approach things with a view toward eternity. You need to ask yourself, will this person help me get to heaven? I think especially today, so many people are geared toward the, the sensual, the sexual aspect of it, when in reality, that's just a small part of what marriage is all about. How is this person going to love me? Are they going to help me to put God first? Will they help me to develop a godly family? And ultimately, will they help me to reach that eternal home that God has prepared? And so, in this book, as we've mentioned some already, we want to note just for a minute the key characters in the book. There is Solomon, of course, who is the author of this book, and he is, as it were, courting or dating this Shulamite woman, who is the, the, the woman that he speaks to. They speak back and forth in, in Hebrew prose, a very poetic style. Then, of course, there are the daughters of Jerusalem. These we might think of as her best friends. Maybe they'll end up being bridesmaids. We don't know all the details. And so they're the ones who are kind of in her corner, helping her, encouraging her. And then you have some antagonists. These are known as the little foxes in the book. And those are her brothers. And they seem to maybe be creating a little jealousy, maybe even trying to break things up a time or two, but their love does weather the storm, as we will see through the Song of Solomon. Now, along the way, there are three different allegorical, or there are three different views that some have suggested to the Song of Solomon, and, and understanding the correct one of these, I think, will help us in understanding the book. There is first... It's what some would term as an allegorical view. That is, that the whole message is nothing more than an allegory. God is here through Solomon and the Shulamite expressing His love and His relationship between Israel and Himself. While there may be some applications along the way that would apply to any relationship, this is not mentioned in the book. You have to read into the book this idea for God nor Israel are mentioned in the book. The two people are mentioned, Solomon and the Shulamite. Then there's a second view, and this would be known as a, a typical or a type view, and that is that this is representative of Christ and the church. The main problem with that is, this book was written by Solomon. It was written in a years, thousands of years before the church, and it was designed when it was written to help people. Now, how would this book help? How would the readers that Solomon wrote this big book for and, and people who picked it up during the day of Solomon, how would they get anything out of this message if this is about Christ and the church? Then there is that third and final view, the view that we think the Scripture does affirm, and that is a literal view. That is, Solomon and the Shulamite are actually in love, and this book serves as a, a manual, a, a guidebook in dealing with marriage and, and really celebrating the beauty of married love between two godly people, and thus the book of Solomon shows the importance of marriage and love that comes from that. Now, as we think about this book, let's then turn our attention with that third view in mind to how can a person read the book of Song of Solomon and have a happy marriage? Well, first, you've got to be able to exalt your mate's qualities as Solomon does here in this book. Look in chapter 1, beginning in verses 2 and 4, Solomon and the Shulamite, they go back and forth in honoring and exalting one another's good qualities. 
chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, The Shulamite says of Solomon, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore the virgins love you. Draw me away. And so as we think about looking at the good qualities of your mate, not, not everybody has the same talents, not everybody has the same abilities, but we all have good qualities that can be exalted. Maybe your mate is trustworthy. Maybe that the honesty, trustworthiness, all those things are things that need to be part of a, a godly marriage and whatever they excel in. We need to honor that. We need to lift that up. Don't we all need to be built up at times? Hebrews 3 verse 12, Paul said, I beg you, therefore by the mercies of God, uh, that as we think about, that we beware, that we encourage one another daily and so much more as we see the day approaching. Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25 as well. And so our responsibility and part of making for a good marriage is don't run people down, build them up. Try to encourage them. Try to lift their good qualities up and help them grow in the character they want to be. Then as we think about the Song of Solomon, we also learn that to make marriage work, not only do you have to exalt the good qualities, you have to be willing to overlook or not be harping all the time on blemishes that people may have. Look in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. The Shulamite says, I am dark but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Now here's how she feels. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keepers of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. And so she felt like because her skin was dark, that made her less beautiful. Not to Solomon. Solomon doesn't seem to let that be a part of what he loves this woman for. And so as we make application along the way, there are blemishes that all of us might have, whether those be physical, whether those be internal, whatever they may be. There are things that we all might like to change. But friend, it, it, instead of focusing on that, and instead of being negative or always maybe mentioning that, you got to learn to overlook things in marriage. You've got to learn that nobody's perfect, self-included, and thus we start where we are and we work from that and we grow in our love for one another. Thirdly, as we think about the Song of Solomon and, and what it is that makes a happy marriage, not only do you have to look for the good qualities, learn maybe to overlook some things, some blemishes, you also have to learn to express your love to one another. Look in Song of Solomon chapter 1, beginning in verse number 9. Solomon says, I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your necks with chains of gold. And so here you see Solomon expressing his love for this woman. The characteristics and the images that they use may come from a, a different era, a different time period. Historically, we may not put it the same way, but you can see how he is encouraging, how he is expressing the love that he has for this woman. Friend, aren't you thankful that God has expressed his love for us? God so loved the world, he gave. John 3, verse 16. The Bible says, Cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. God's not only expressed it, He's expressed it to the greatest length in giving His Son. And friend, all of us need to be loved. All of us need to feel that we're loved and know that there are others who love us. And one of the ways we know that is not only by actions, but by words. And so here, Solomon does exactly that. And of course, the Shulamite as well, later in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. A fourth thing then that we learn to make happy marriages is you've got to remember the springtime, if we can use that word, of your marriage. Remember what it was like when you were first married. Remember the youth of marriage and, and what it was that brought you together in the first place. Look in chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. Here the Shulamite remembers the springtime of their love when she says, My beloved spoke and said to me, 
Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs. The vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. O oh, my dove, in the cleft of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face, let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Here we find that these two are deep in love in this chapter and, and as we think about their relationship in the future and some of the hurdles they'll face and some of the challenges that even you'll see in the book of Song of Solomon, they're reminded of just how much they initially loved each other, what they had in common, that, that God had to be at the center of the relationship, no doubt, as Solomon progresses in his knowledge and wisdom and as he comes back to the Lord especially. This is key to making marriage work. Are things always going to be like they were at first? Not always, but you've got to remember that. You've got to remember what brought you together and the key fundamental ideas that your marriage was built upon. God first. Psalm 127 verses 1 through 3, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Secondly, helping one another, being heirs of the grace of life, 1 Peter 3, 7, and helping one another get to heaven, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Thirdly, bringing a godly family into this world that can impact it, that can change society for good, and leaving a Christian legacy behind. Those are things that ought to encourage and uplift all of us as we think about marriage and the beauty of married love. Then we think about this. For marriage to work, you've got to remove any external circumstances that might get in the way or ruin one's marriage. Notice chapter 2, verse number 15. Hear her brothers say, Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Here they're, they're trying to draw her away. They're trying to put the focus off of Solomon, put her focus off of Solomon and back on them. Maybe a little jealousy here. We don't know all the details, but what we do know is this. Their external circumstances, maybe, maybe it's family, maybe it's job, maybe it's money, maybe it's recreation, whatever it may be. If you're going to make marriage work, you've got to put first things first. As we've mentioned, God but your family needs to come in a close second to that. And so remove those external circumstances. You remember Genesis 2, 24? The scripture says in chapter 2, verse 24, for this reason, listen, a man shall leave his father and mother. That's the removal of certain circumstances, certain family circumstances there. There is the leaving of father and mother and the cleaving to wife. And thus, the need to remove certain things. Maybe you've got a hobby that's very time consuming. You ought to ask yourself, am I really putting the time into my marriage that I ought to? Maybe your job requires a lot of you. You need to ask yourself, is this job really worth it? Is it putting stress and strain on my marriage? And then we all have to consider, are we putting our families first spiritually? Are we making sure that external circumstances are out of the way so that we can serve the Lord together, so that we can evangelize together, and so that we can assemble with the saints to worship the Almighty together. And then of course, chapter 2, verse 16. To have a happy marriage, you've got to be fully committed to one another. Notice chapter 2, verse 16. The Shulamite, Shulamite says it this way, My beloved is mine, and I am his, he feeds his flock among the lilies. Here you've got that, that idea of ownership. My beloved is mine, and I am his. You can see the 100% the commitment and dedication they have to one another. Does that mean you can't have friends? That's not what we're saying. Does that mean you can't have interest? No, that's not what's, what's the idea here. But the interest is, when you enter into marriage, you're making a commitment. You're making a commitment before God to another person that lasts for a lifetime. Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. And so realize, you are theirs. They are yours. You've given yourself to them in every way. 1 Corinthians 7, 1, 5, 1 through 5, and Romans 7, 1 through 4. And thus, 
You must have that type of commitment. Young people especially, when you begin to think about and seriously think about who you're going to spend your life with, who you're going to date, who you're going to marry, realize this, that is a lifelong commitment. Enter into it knowing that, prepared for that, and if that scares you, then friend, you better rethink your commitments and your relationships and not enter into anything lightly because those things are serious and have eternal consequences as well. Then we want to mention this also. As we study the Song of Solomon, we have to keep our desire. One of the things we learn in the book of Song of Solomon is we have to keep our desire in check. There is a proper place for desire and passion inside marriage. And I want you to notice Song of Solomon chapter 7, verse number 10. The Bible here says, the Shulamite speaking, I am my beloved's, my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Friend, there's nothing wrong with passion, desire, and the sensual aspect of love inside marriage. Do you remember Hebrews 13, 4? Marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Desire, passion, sensuality, all those things. Inside the bound of marriage, inside the, the framework of marriage, are natural. But as we think about love and what that means, we must realize that there is a proper place. In God's plan for marriage, Things that often do so much harm are things like pornography, all oh, the marriages that have been broken up or have suffered because of pornography. Can you really, if you're looking at pornography, viewing those ungodly images, whether it be on the television or the internet, which it's so easy to do today, is your desire really for your mate? Then we can mention other things like adultery, desire for someone else having an extramarital relationship. Friend, that's contrary to the will of God. That's something that will destroy one's marriage. And so keep your desire in check. Make sure that it, it stays in the proper scope that God planned it inside marriage. And that's part of the beauty of married love that God set forth. And then we want to mention what marriage and what love really is. I want you to notice again Song of Solomon chapter 8, verses 6 following. This is such a beautiful passage about married love. Notice these words. The Shulamite says, Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. It's flames. Jealousy's flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. And so when we think about what love is, let's realize that, that love, married love, is secure. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, the, the writer will say here. There has to be a certain amount of security in love, certain amount of, of trust, that we trust one another fully, that we feel safe, that we really do feel at home and that all is well and that we're trying to serve God and that there isn't any external circumstances wreaking havoc in our married lives. Then as we think about Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 6, we realize that married love's not only secure, it's strong. The Bible says, for love is as strong as death. All oh, the power of love. Look at what it's done to nations. Look at what it's done to, to leaders. Look at what, what it does to people's lives today. The strength of it, if used properly, is one of the greatest tools that we have. I know love's strong, but that's what motivated God to send His Son. It must have taken something strong to do that. John 3, 16. Now, if our marriages have that type of love, Look at what our family, our families can be a bulwark for the faith. They can be a, a fortress, a, a, a fortified a place of safety, honesty, security, and spiritual growth for the family. But for that to be the case, there must be real love. Love that's not just a feeling, but that's action. Jesus said, if you love me, 
keep my commandments. John 14, 15, love that isn't afraid at times to even rebuke. Proverbs 27, 5 says open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Love that corrects and disciplines along the way, whether there be children in the relationship as well. That's real love and that's what makes the marriage so strong. And then the writer mentions this, that love that we have ought to be unquenchable. That is, it ought to be a fire burning at all times. Notice chapter 8, verse 7 again. Many waters cannot quench it, nor can the floods drown it out. Well, what ought our love life to be like? It ought to be a burning fire. It ought to be a burning passion that we have for one another. It ought to be something that you couldn't take enough water in the world to put that type of fire out because it's built not just on feeling, it's built on fact as well. It's built on trust, it's built on truth, and it's built on two people striving to help one another get to heaven and truly being heirs of the grace of life. And then that love, it's priceless. Notice chapter 8, verse 7 again. The Bible says, If a man were to give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Let's say you had the wealth of Bill Gates or, or Ross Perot. Would you trade that for love? Would love be worth that? Not at all. You couldn't give enough money in the world for true love. Friend, as we think about marriage and as we think about true love, we want to close by reminding each of us just how much God loves us and how He wants us in a spiritual sense to enter into a relationship with Him. Remember John 3:16. God so loves the world, loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. View of the love of God and all that He did for us. In view of that, we need to make sure that we are in a relationship with Him. Have you obeyed the gospel? Do you believe that Jesus is God's Son? John chapter 8, verse 24. Do you believe it so much so that in response to that love, you would change your life and repent? Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Would you be willing to make the great confession that Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And to be saved and enter into Christ, would you be immersed in water? Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. May God help each of us to make our marriages and our relationship with Him what it ought to be. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, this not your wife. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee 37111.